Amen. Glory to God that he took our place dying on a cross even though we don't know what he saw in us but he did that for love so let's uh, read the word of God right now that is in first Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1 to 11 it says the word of the Lord Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. The word of the Lord says. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to share with you a testimony because yesterday we had for the first time the meeting of young people of our virtual church together with the uh, uh, young people of the church in Santa Cruz and it was an extraordinary and joyful and happy for me exactly because it was a, a, a great joy to to put uh, to meet the faces of those people in the virtual church and even our uh, young people were able to meet uh, the those uh, young people in the virtual church some people have said when once we told them about the virtual church he said what kind of thing this looks crazy but you know what There are things from God that for men, they're crazy. And when when God told uh, Noah to uh, uh, build an ark, it was crazy to them. But the Lord is going to demand from his children that for people, they are crazy, but they're to glorify him. And all the, the young people gave testimony and they were very happy. And thank God it is the beginning of something very beautiful that the Lord is going to do in, in, in the church at, at large and in the young, uh, the young people and I pray that that this uh, thing that he's started he's gonna complete it so the Lord bless you glory to God well we're very happy that we have been able to be here today uh, publishing this meeting in spite of all the difficulties in spite of all the lockdowns in spite of all the things that have gone on there is gonna be another meeting very important meeting We're going to have a meeting for the first time of all those people that up to very few moments away, they were attending the Catholic Church. Uh, some of those people, most of them have gone, uh, gone away and in principle they have said they don't want, they don't wish to go back to congregate in the Catholic Church. Uh, many of those people have never uh, been able to attend any other churches and logically they have a lot of questions, they have a lot of doubt and that's why we're going to celebrate tomorrow on Monday at 7.30 via Zoom a meeting to uh, help them, to uh, give them uh, answers to all the questions that they may have. It, those people 
that some of them are just converted to the Lord and they have started to read their Bibles for the first time in their lives and they have a lot of curiosity and a, a lot of desire to learn more about the Lord. So I pray that, that you will continue pray with us so that this meeting will be a blessing and that we can enjoy a beautiful time and to get to know each other because most of them, they watch us, but we don't see them. And it is going to be the first time that we're going to see each other and going to see the faces of those people. And I ask that you continue to pray for the Lord to give us uh, wisdom to uh, lead this meeting. And then most of these people will get the answers that they need to strengthen their faith and to continue their walk with Christ. Let's pray this afternoon and we're going to ask uh, the, Lord, the Lord his blessing so that the word will be, uh, our heart will be open to hear what the Lord has prepared for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks in this afternoon, my God, for this privilege that we have to be with you today. Lord, I ask you that you will touch our hearts, that you will speak through your precious and blessed word. In the name of Jesus, I ask you that you will direct this service and that everything that I, we speak will uh, fall in fertile soil, that your name will be glorified and that you can speak to your children church according to the needs that we have and that our ears and our hearts will be open and attend to listen to your voice and learn from you. We put this time in you in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. We have read today a portion of one of the letters that Apostle Paul wrote to the brothers and sisters in Thessaloniki. There are two letters that Paul wrote to that uh, church, and we have said it before that this is the church where Paul stayed the least amount of time. Really, according to the facts that we have and the information that is given uh, by the book of Acts, he was only there for three weeks. And in three weeks, a, a, a beautiful church was birthed that suffered a lot of persecution with time and the Apostle Paul has to write two letters to those uh, brothers and sisters to encourage them, to give them instructions, concrete instructions and explain to them what is happening and to not get discouraged but to just encourage one another. In both letters, Apostle Paul uh, talks about the end times. He talks and he makes reference to the Antichrist, to the coming of the Lord, to the rapture of the church, to the resurrection of the believers, etc. Now, we, in, at this moment, my dear brothers and sisters, without any doubt, are the generation of believers that are, have been ever been closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to rapture his church than any other generation along history. I know that in these 21 uh, uh, centuries, believers, not all the time, but many believers, have been always expecting the coming of the Lord, and he hasn't come yet. But I want to remind you the words that said that the, the Lord is not going to be slow to, to fulfill his promise. A lot of people say he's delaying it, but he is patient with all of us, wishing that everybody will repent. But there is no doubt that we are very close of the end. All the time we're closer to those end time facts that we read in Revelation and that we know them at like the seals, the horsemen of the apocalypse, the seven trumpets, the bolts of wrath, etc., etc. If we read the Bible, especially these uh, end times facts, the biblical eschatology facts, we have to be honest and realistic and say to everyone, believers and non-believers, that what is coming in the future is not going to be something good. It's not going to be a prosperity uh, time and blessing and peaceful and safety, but on the contrary. 
we believers are not afraid for that. We are not supposed to be afraid of that because we know in whom we have believed and our trust and our faith has been placed in the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we do not have to know that times and the end times are times that are difficult times, very dangerous times, war uh, times, etc., etc. Many believers, I believe, thank God, have realized that we are very close to the end time uh, facts. But unfortunately, a lot of believers, we have to say, are not even aware of, of how close we are of the prophecies that have not been fulfilled, but they are very soon to be fulfilled. The reading of this uh, afternoon, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, is very curious because the Apostle Paul tells them in that time uh, regarding the, those times, you do not have the, to write to you. It is curious because he said you do not need to write to you, but if Paul was visiting our churches today and he will see how the churches are in the world, he will not say the same. He will probably say regarding the times we do have to write to you that I write and that I teach you what is going to happen. Paul talk about a lot of things throughout all the epistles. He touches a lot of uh, uh, themes, and they're very interesting facts. But in more than 50 times, listen, in more than 50 times, Apostle Paul talks very clearly about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. N then, he taught the church of the first century and throughout and through and to all believers throughout these 21 uh, centuries that Christ was going to return. Now, between this time that we're living now and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church, there's a lot of things that are going to have to happen in this time. In, in these end times and those things we have to know them not only know them but put everything in its place orderly in an orderly manner because everybody has heard about the mark of the beast or the false prophet the antichrist and also the the battle of armageddon or the two witnesses or the seals the trumpets of the millennial a lot of believers have heard about those things a lot of times. But unfortunately, at the time to put everything in order, in a chronological order, all these uh, things that are going to happen, a lot of people don't know. So it's very important to read and read and read and, and just search the scriptures because this, the Bible says, the Bible gives us ex the exact order. We do not have to make it up. We don't have to wait until the angel of heaven comes and descends and tells us this is what is going to happen. First this, second this, third this. No. All those things that the Lord wants us to know, we already have it in the Bible revealed to us. Simply, it is a, it's a time to study it and to see the order of things that are going to happen in the last days. So there is a lot, lot of need to teach an instruction regarding eschatological themes. Now, not only in the book of uh, Revelation, but in, also, in all the verses in the Bible, that in the last day we can see that the spiritual world, where the angels, where seraphims, where cherubims, where the archangels, or the demons, the, prin the principalities, the powers of darkness, the authorities in the spiritual darkness, are, are going to be manifested in a way very big and clear. The spiritual world has before a, 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 a big a thing has been shaken. Look, for, for example, in the Old Testament, when the people of Israel has very little time to come out of Babylon from captivity, there is a movement in the whole spiritual world that was not normal. As a, as a fact, 
at Daniel the prophet when he was uh, uh, fasting and praying for three weeks when he visited the, the visit of angel Gabriel the same one that went to Maria in, in Bethlehem to announce the birth of the Messiah he said that he comes with a message. He comes with a revelation, with a concrete, a specific revelation of what is going to happen now and in the future. And another archangel, very powerful, the archangel that has been assigned to take care of the to the people of Israel, the archangel Michael, is said that he has been fighting with the prince of Persia, that in that occasion, he's talking about Satan, even though he said that the prince of Persia, and that he's been fighting, and that from the beginning of the the prayer of the Daniel, it was his his prayer was listened, but he couldn't answer it because there is a conflict in the spiritual realm, and those conflicts. A spiritual conflicts that are happening all before anything that's substantially important are going to come back and the spiritual world is going to be shaken in the last days of an incredible way. As a matter of fact, the book as that that more angels that do extraordinary things is, is in the book of Revelation. Now, The angelical world, the spiritual world, cannot act independent from God. So what I mean is that to move a little finger just to say something, it has to be under the covering and until the authorization of God. In Revelation chapter 6, as of verse 1, there are very interesting words that I would like to read this afternoon for all of you. Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. I watch as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come, and then I look. And there before me was a white horse, and his rider held the bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. There are two passages in the book of Revelation that, that, that it seems that they talk about the same person, but it's not true. One is chapter 6, and one is chapter 19. In chapter 6, There is a white horse that appears that is ridden by a person that it doesn't say who the person is, but it says that the one that really had, a, had held the bow, and the bow in, in the Bible always is referenced to, a, a, to a, a military power. So the one writing it has military power over armies. And it was given a crown, so, which is a synonym of authority. And he wrote out as the conqueror and to conquest. In chapter 19, uh, there is another white horse, but the one riding it, the Bible says who it is. It is in his robe, he has a, a, a title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we all know who he is, who our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, we cannot say that the, the white horses and uh, on chapter 6 is the same one as in 19. And nothing is further from the truth. It looks like it's the same, but they don't have one to look with each other. Because the crown that appears in, uh, in Revelation 19 is different than the word crown that is in uh, chapter 6. Crown in, in chapter 6 is Estefania. And the one, the crown in chapter 19 is diadem. One is the crown of a king, and another one is the is one who conquers, or he, he's given a, a prize. So there are two different people, two different people. Now, Apostle Paul says that in the last day, the nations, some nations, not all of them, some continents, 
Algunos continentes are going to try to uh, be in agreement to reach treaties with the objective of uh, uh, being able to live in peace and safety. The last uh, great treaty that was signed where the, the world peace, as it couldn't be any other way, was the, the treaty that, that has been uh, named the Treaty of Abraham, that some nations, uh, Muslim nations, have made an agreement with the people of Israel and a supposed peace. And they have started to, to visit each other from one country to the other and going in the, in the air by plane. And now they're going to be uh, just exchanging com commerce. And everything sounds wonderful because people like to hear about harmony and peace and that people get along one with each other, but etc. But look at this. That 2,000 years ago, Apostle Paul, when he wrote the letter to our, to our brothers in Thessaloniki, he said something like this. When, they, when you hear that they say peace and safety, then over them, destruction is going to come like the, the pain in a woman giving birth. The world peace and the world safety, because there is no safety if it's not peace. And when there is peace, there is safety. And look how these two words are coming again 2,000 years later of this letter written by Paul. And it says, the Bible says, when he's going to say that, the ones that have done this treaty with the objective to obtain peace and safety. When they say that, at last, at last we're going to get along like brothers and sisters because we all are descendants from our father Abraham. When they say, at last we have come to peace and safety, then they're going to come destruction over them all of a sudden. And the example was when a woman was... Uh, Uh, all of a sudden have uh, birth pains because she's pregnant and she's not going to be able to escape it. So the men will try at all costs to sign peace treaties to agree on peace, but the, the, the real truth can peace cannot come without God. What a difference when Jesus Christ said to these disciples and all of us, therefore I give you peace and I leave you with peace, not like the world gives. We know that many times a lot of agreements and treaties and agreements of peace and, at the, and later the same ones that sat on the table to sign for it, they ended up breaking it and fighting against each other. Then the world when they talk about peace and safety has nothing to do with the real peace and the real safety that comes when we are in peace with God. Romans 5.1 Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and as far as I know, the Lord Jesus wasn't invited to that. That I know in this last treaty, in this last human effort to reach peace, they left God uh, aside and they didn't let him sit at the table. So what path is peace is going to be uh, happening when the Prince of Peace has not been invited among nations that have been fighting for each other for, for centuries? So let's not be naive and not let's not believe that men in a half an hour sitting around the table with checkbooks on hand and all the good intentions of the world and good uh, uh, dress they can obtain what God can obtain only when we repent and we humble ourselves and we ask for forgiveness then his peace comes to live in our hearts into our homes and in our nations but while God doesn't get invited he's the author of the of the peace then the peace that the humans can sign then there will be broken and then you will know in, in a few times that those treaties 
are worthless. Apostle Paul gives a lot of instructions uh, regarding how we have to act. Not being like uh, in, in na na being naive in, and in these uh, 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 traps. All the enemies are getting along. The Apostle Paul says we are not from the darkness. We are children of light. Therefore, do not fall asleep like they do. And on the side it says, encourage and, and edify each other with these words so that you are having doing. So we have a manual, a perfect manual, that is the word of God, through which we know how the peace comes and how the peace don't come. Now, the word of God says, and, and same Jesus said, that the last days are going to be uh, just like the times of Noah. And in a curious way, the times of Noah were not peaceful and were not going in history because they were the golden age of the, of the world peace. The, the, the best time, the best age of uh, prosperity, of peace, etc. was during the King Solomon. That, by the way, the, the word Shalom is included is in, in his name, Solomon. That was the time of maximum splendor in Israel. Outside of that 40, 50 year period, there is not real peace in that nation and in the world. And the Bible says, that the, during the last days that the, the teachings of Jesus Christ have been times as the times of Noah. And how were the times of Noah? Oh, there were very bad times, violence. There was no principles, no morals. And there were times so horrible that God said, that's enough. That's enough. That's the, and, and that's where we're going. So make an ark and let's start from zero. And the world that Noah left was not the same that he found at the end when he came out of the ark. So if the Lord Jesus said, and we trust him, a hundred percent of his teachings and his words that the last times, our times right now, our generation, our days have been the same and very similar to the times of Noah means that we are not going to have a tranquility or peace or anything because he could have said the times are going to be like the Solomon times. Well, glory to God. Or the times of the prophet Daniel or Malachi, or Nehemiah, but no, with everything and thousands of persons and things that happen in the history of the Bible, it says that our generation will be very, very close to the times of Noah. So therefore, it is very important to read everything related to what happened before, during, and after the flood, because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, what what was is going to be what, what happened later. So in order for us to know what is going to happen, we have to know what happened before. Because it's like a circle, and we go around and around to the times of aggressiveness, of promiscuity, of horrible things, etc., etc., of flood, of catastrophes, just as the times of Noah. But glory to God that during that perverse generation, in that generation that was not worthy of the mercy of God, he lifted up a family. He, Noe, Noah and his family with his son Shem, Ham and Hafed, wives and the other wives. Just as the word says, where the sin abounds, the Mercy, the grace abounds more. So it doesn't matter how bad situations are right now, the, the Lord is always going to keep a remnant that have trusted and have obeyed his word. How many people say amen? Noah went through the flood, of course. The ark just went ahead. Where he built the, no, the ark, and when the ark was found, there is a lot of kilometers between them. 
He had more than a year inside the, the, the ship, but never he lacked food. None of them died. Not even an animal died during that time that were inside the ark in lockdown, curiously locked down inside the ark. Not even the animals died of nothing, but God protected them, his children, their wives, his marriage, his family, and when they come out of the ark, he gave testimony that God is going to make us uh, pass through a flood or a valley of shadow of death, but we can be assured because he, his rod and his staff will comfort us. Glory to God. So now, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, it says, something very important that sometimes people don't realize. I saw when the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. In the biblical time, there were no books. There were uh, uh, scrolls. There were pergaments on which you wrote. And then in some cases, you put some seals, like those that we're looking at the screen, so that nobody can read it what was inside that seal, that scroll. In this case, the book of Revelation, chapter 6, from the last chapter, they are talking about a scroll that is sealed, that is protected by seven seals. And each time that they break one of those seals in, on earth, something bad is going to happen. And very bad thing that brings death and, and inflation and some tragedy happens. The beginning of the seals mark the beginning of the Great Tribulation or the beginning of, of uh, time of Jacob's trouble. They're not seals that bring blessing. They're, they don't bring, bring peace. They don't bring prosperity. On the contrary, they don't bring life. They, on the contrary, it is the beginning of the wrath of God. Because we talk about, about the love of God, and of course, that's what we have to do, and the mercy of God, and the faithfulness of God, but the same God is also that He has wrath. And the Word of God says that the wrath of God has been contained during a lot of time, but when, when it comes out in the first seal until the second coming of Christ, there will be calamities, there will be tragedies, there will be birth pains, etc. The one who opens the seal is not the devil. The one that starts this, this stage, this, this era, is not Satan. It's not the politicians. It's not men. It's the Lamb. And who's the Lamb? John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The, the Lamb is Christ. And Christ says, I'm going to open the first, the second, the third, and so forth until the seventh. So therefore, it's not a, 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 by chance. It's not that things just happen and then we say, what's going on? What God wants, that's what is going on because nothing happens by, ca by casualty. The devil cannot do whatever he wants. The devil has to be submitted to the will of God, to the sovereignty of God. And the one who opens the seal and the one who says, let's go and do it to, to pour, pour the wrath. And let's treat with the nation. Let's try to demonstrate what is written in the Revelation. Now, and then he opens the first seal, is the Lamb, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is it that John does? He just embellishes the, or decorate the last times of the future with imagery of the, of the present. Why? Is he using the word seals? 
sellos, scrolls, because that's what the people knew at that time. Therefore, he's using a language that is known to explain things that are going to happen in the future so that they will understand and have no doubt what the Lord is trying to say and teach to his people because the book of Revelation is not written to the unbeliever. It is written for the church. Those churches that were mentioned in chapters 2 and 3, those seven churches, and all the Christians along the history. Now, Apostle Paul John talks about the white horse. Everybody knew why uh, a white horse was used. Have you ever asked yourselves why Jesus, when he came in Jerusalem, he didn't use a white horse? Because he also, he only used a don donkey, something so humbly and simple. Because in the Old Testament, horses are synonyms of war, are synonyms of, pa of military power. Curiously, Israel has never used horses to go to war. Never. Those have horses, those have chariots, but we have the name of the Lord our God. But it is interesting to know that the Romans, when they conquer so, a, a country, a kingdom, or some or a place, and they will do the parade, and they will enter Rome, all of the ones on horses, most of them were walking, but all those that were riding horses, they have to use white horses like saying the enemy has been defeated the enemy has been trash and so that all of them can see that from afar that the enemy has gone when they see thousands of white horses coming to Rome to parade is the signal that we have won the war therefore Satan that is an imitator of the work of God, imitating Christ when he comes on the second coming on a white horse, not on, on a donkey again when he came to die, but he comes triumphantly riding on the clouds from heaven with power and glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Like Satan knows perfectly that, what he does is that to the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the Anti-Messiah, on a symbolic way, he presents himself like coming on a white horse, like saying, we are the ones who have obtained victory. But that's further from the truth, because the Bible says that the day that Christ died on the cross of Calvary, Satan was wounded. And never again, Satan is going to have dominion and control that he had for a while. So he came in white horses, they came in, a, in the parade, in those military power, uh, parades, and they came with, bow, with bows, uh, demonstrating military power. In the last days, we're going to see expressions like, and manifestations like, like of big military power. Aren't you uh, surprised that all of a sudden, without any advice, all of a sudden we see military things happening in North Korea, and then we see planes and missiles and helicopters and ships and everything, and then after that we see in the in the in Moscow, and then we see missiles and we see a parade. Why all that? It's like a way to say we have power. We have, we can do with the world anything that we want. But then I go to the first, the one who opens and closes, and the one who says now or not yet, is the Lamb, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, during that this time, we are at war. Not only in a spiritual war. Paul says 
that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers of darkness, against the, the governors of the darkness, and evil in the heavenly places. There is a war 2,000 years ago, it's been going on. So he put, get the helmet, take the breastplate, take the sword, and strengthen yourself. So we are in a war among the nations, not only for the technology, not only hacking itself the internet services, but also we have a war among nations for, create, for creating, for inventing as soon as possible the famous vaccine against the coronavirus. And this will produce thousands and thousands of millions of dollars of profit to the nation that can say for the first time we have the vaccine, we have the antidote to vaccinate 7,500 million people what has never done before because they have to vaccinate everybody small little everybody has to be vaccinated and now there is a war a commercial war among all the pharmaceutical companies to invent this thing as soon as possible nevertheless even though we will have the vaccine right now, the world will continue to come to go to through the countdown because the vaccination can solve the, this virus, but it cannot prevent what the Word of God says. And when they invent, because they're going to invent it without a doubt, when they invent the vaccination against the coronavirus, in a few times, the world is going to pull their heads and go crazy and tore their clothes because they're going to have another virus or some other illness, even worse than the one we have that everybody's experiencing. Why? Because the one who has the control over the earth is not men, is not the politician, is not the bankers, is not the scientists, is our Lord. And our Lord has taught us that the last days are going to be very complicated days, very difficult days. And one of the things that have been happening right now behind scenes is what we all know a, a lot of times about a new system, a new order, a world order, where everything is going to change, medicine, work, the economy. As a matter of fact, as even the churches are changing. We're, we're using systems so that we can bring the gospel to the homes of millions and millions of, of, of Christians that cannot meet anymore. Everything is changing, but it's very drastically changing. It's very fast changing that the men have not been able to assimilate what is happening right now in very few months. Look, we started this year, 2020, and it hasn't even finished, and the world has changed in a complete way. And we have never are going to be able to say the, the normal, but the world and our lives are going to change radically for everybody as of now. And now, you and I have to ask ourselves as believers, Lord, and now what can we do? Because the Lord did not allow us to be born on the first century and meet Christ and the apostles and maybe belong to one of those churches or be martyred by like some of those uh, 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 people. He did not. He didn't uh, allow us to be born in the Middle Age, where a lot of uh, times they thought that Christianity had disappeared. The Lord did not allow us to be born of being pastors in in the fur in the first world, World War I, World War II, where a lot of our friends and pastors died in concentration camps. The Lord allowed us to be born today. And the changes that have been happening since the day we were born to today are tremendous. Many of us, that we are at some age, when we were born, we didn't know anything about the internet or cellular phones or social media that that is a normal thing for millions and millions of young people and even children. 
And we have adapted. We have adapted to, to a world that is going fast and faster. But in the spiritual world, it's going to be very big too. And we have to learn to adapt to these times. And what the Bible says, I want to repeat, is the same. Pay attention. Brothers, you are not in darkness. So I said in ignorance, or you don't know, or in the previous life that you knew before Christ, we're not in that life. Now, you are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. It is interesting to note that the first reference to darkness and, and there is in the Bible appears in Genesis 1 where the Bible says on the side of the earth on the abyss there was darkness but in the other side there was light and in that where the part that was light the spirit of the Lord was hovering over there was darkness there was disorder, there was, there was chaos, but the Spirit of the Lord, literally, it says, it was hovering over the earth in the part that there was light. And this gives us a message very important because in the last days, we're going to see like the Lord says in Matthew 24, an increase of the wickedness. What we right now are going to try to teach in our children in school not even in the past the adults will not even know what the children know in a textbook today the proliferation of the of the evil of the sin the accessible of the sin that you can have in a little cell phone the whole world in your hand we have never seen anything like that or dream about it the wickedness, the darkness, the disorder has been and continued to increase. And the Bible says that the effect of those, the multiplication of the wickedness is going to do something horrible because of this, the love of many, not, not going to disappear, but it says that it's going to grow cold. And it is curious to know that one of the churches that received the book of Revelation, one of the problems they had of that congregation of Laodicea was that they were have grown cold, they were not they were not cold or hot, they were lukewarm. And to that church, the Lord said, confronted them and said, if you don't change, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. So in, a, in one way, we're going to see a, an evilness growing in the movies, in the theaters, in the churches, in the political arena, in everything. But in another way, the Bible says that we as children of the light, of children of the day, in another letter that we wrote, it says that we have to shine and be like luminaries in the world. I like it a lot to watch the stars during the night, but you know when you can see them better? When there is no light. When the light of of the sun is out there just illuminating us nobody can see the stars the stars are only being able to be seen at night that means that we like those luminaries like those stars the more dark as where, where the difficult situation more people have to see us like different the, the Lord said, Abraham, go and see out of your tent and count the stars to see if you're capable of doing that. So he said, at night, count the stars because in the daytime you couldn't see them and you couldn't count them. So therefore, God said, put us in a generation of a lot of darkness. God has put us in a, in a, in a, in a society in a nation, in a generation, where the wickedness is everywhere. Everywhere. Therefore, it is our responsibility of the church in this time. It's very big. 
because we cannot say or be thinking, what am I going to work? Where am I going to eat? That cannot be the, the most important thing that you think about. The priority of our lives is not what we're going to eat, how am I going to pay the rent, and tomorrow, what am I going to wear? Jesus, you know what he said? You know what he said to those kind of people? That's how the Gentiles live. That's how the people uh, live, that they don't have a powerful God, that they're thinking only about how am I going to live, how I'm going to eat. Look at the birds of the sea, the Lord says. They do not do anything, but your Father in heaven feeds them. How much more to you? men of little faith so we have to make a difference in our vocabularies make a difference in the way that we react in front of the problems in other words be ambassadors in the in the in times of darkness because the ones who sleep they sleep at night and the one that get drunk they get drunk at night it is curious to know that in justice there is uh, that the darkness has an increase of of, uh, of sin because during the night is where more where you find more murders more uh, robberies and bad things because they hide in the darkness and the the murder the one that is going to kidnap that he tries not to be seen and not in the light of day so the the lord jesus says that there are people that have been used to live in the darkness they are used to living in the in the dark places and they just like the scene and there is a time where they enjoy and they boast of what they do but paul or the lord through pa 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 paul we say we are not like that we are not of that world of that style of, of living but we are from the light and we are children of the day so we finish saying be sober and we say and what what is that pronoun that is mentioned in the bible what does it mean to be sober according to the biblical text it is curious because in a lot of places they associate that as if you if you uh, drink alcohol or dr or use drugs in other words, the sobriety in the Bible talks about self-control, as what we know about controlling ourselves. It is one of the requisites to serve God. You can read the, the letter to Timothy, and in the large list of requisites and requirements, those who are going to be elders or deacons, they have to be people that are sober, that are out of control, that are, that are not people that the emotions are going to be of betraying them, that their addictions, their love of money are, is going to betray them, but they're owners of their own act. That is what it means to be sober, with auto self-control. And it says, dress with the breastplate of righteousness and, and the hopes of salvation as, the, as, as a helmet. There's no excuse to be unseen in this generation. There is no excuse to waste your time. There is no excuse to say, what do you want from me? There is, here is everything you need to know. Here is there, all the instructions, clear, very concrete and specific to be able to live lives, Christian lives in victory. If you want to live in this generation, perverse generation, giving a testimony, shining and making a difference. You can do it because the Lord has given us everything that we need to live lives in Christ. How many people say amen? Let's pray this afternoon. Close your eyes where you are and let's ask the Lord that in this day, this day and as of today, God will keep us. God will take care of us and that the Lord will use us so that we don't fall in the, in the trap to know that the, the, what the world brings us is genuine because the only truth only is in our God, in our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Father, we give you thanks for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the tre treatment that you have with us. Father, we beg you that you strengthen your church over all the earth, that you will help us, blessed Father, to live in victory and holiness all the days of our lives. Father, I know that times are coming, there are difficult times, and the spiritual world is just awaiting orders. Things are going to change. But we know that you are the same yesterday, today, and then the future, Lord. And we know that we ask you to help us, help us to be near you in these final times that we are living now, that we can shine for you like luminaries in the world. We give you thanks for your work that is alive and is, uh, is good for us in which we can find answers and instructions to live lives, victorious lives. We put our lives into your hands in the name, in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Dear brethren, may the Lord bless you richly. I wish you that you will have a, a very blessed week. Remember all the brothers that have been uh, contacting us through uh, the WhatsApp group that we have created, we're going to have a meeting on Monday uh, with the, all the people, ex-Catholics, that have questions, that have doubts, and, and it's going to be via Zoom at 7.30 in the afternoon. We're going to send you the link a few minutes ago. Uh, the meeting, we're going to be sending you that. And another thing, very important, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the communion, the Holy Communion, the, with the bread and the wine to remember the death and the resurrection and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So to those people who are not able to congregate and are seeing us through the social media, we encourage you that you will have ready in your homes the bread and the wine, that when the time comes of participating together with us, you can do that. Next Sunday, may the Lord once. My dear brethren, may God bless you. I will tell you to uh, say hello, but the ones that are at home, they can do that. May the Lord keep you. May you have a wonderful week. Bless, pray, read the world, and live very close to the Lord, because the Lord is coming soon. How many people say Amen? Glory to God. May the Lord bless you, my dear brethren. Amen.